Hello, I'm Julia Baird. Channel 9 is in turmoil. It is sacking staff and its Today Show, A Current Affair and its national news are all being trounced by seven. It's hard to imagine few people who would be enjoying the reversal of fortunes more than tonight's guest. I've got to uh, devote more time and energy now to Channel 7 than I do to Channel 9. I can't go looking over the fence all the time and wondering what life's like at Starlight 9. Peter Meekin has been called tabloid, sensationalist and populist, but he has an uncanny knack for understanding what Australians want to watch. For 30 years, he helped make Channel 9 the commercial TV news leader. Then, three years ago, he walked across the road to Seven and took every one of its news and current affairs programs to number one. Some say he's done it by dumbing down programs such as Sunrise and Today Tonight. But Peter Meekin is characteristically unapologetic. Although, as you'll hear in tonight's Sunday Profile interview, he is less than comfortable with some of the things he's done in television. Meekin said he left Nine because he was becoming marginalised by John Alexander, the newspaper man who heads Nine's parent company, PBL. Since moving to Seven, Meekin has delighted in needling his old employer. The latest act of mischief was on Tuesday. A handful of Nine's most important executives were searching the station for their recently demoted head of news and current affairs, Mark Llewellyn. One of them rang his mobile and found it answered by Peter Meekin at Seven, who said... He works for me now. It was, as Meekin says, a gotcha. Well, this is all before the courts at the moment, so I have to try and be a little discreet, which is not my usual nature. Uh, but basically, I knew that Mark was unhappy and gained the impression that he wanted out. So we were sort of happy to oblige him. What was he unhappy with? Well, he was unhappy with being asked to take a pay cut and to answer to, um, to someone who he didn't think he should answer to. And wasn't he cleared out of his office as well without any warning? Uh, that's my understanding, that he left the building briefly, which turned out to be a fatal move, and they started to move the furniture around. But what was interesting about this story was how Nine found out that he had left. Can you tell us what happened? I did feel the call from one of their... Um, executive producers, Mr John Westercott, which was intended for Mark, but I picked up his mobile and answered the phone in an act of mischief. But uh, Because they were looking for him, they were expecting they were him to looking be in a for meeting. Him. As I understand, they were looking for him. I didn't know the reason for the phone call, but I thought uh, if it was John Westercott on the phone, I might as well answer it. And what was the nature of the conversation? It was very brief. It was quite friendly. I think he was a bit surprised that it was me who picked up the phone. <laughs> and uh, I regarded it as a bit of a gotcha and moved on. Well, what do you think has gone wrong at Nine? I think the main thing that's gone wrong at Channel Nine is constant changes of management, which has resulted in an air of panic and probably a loss of confidence by the staff and consequently the viewers. That might be a simplistic look at it, but I think the staff would agree with that assessment. So a loss of direction and identity. Yes, and purpose. There's no sort of common purpose. When do you think the rot started? I mean, I think the first thing that Seven got right was Sunrise, and that was before my time. But in fact, that's while I was at Nine. And they, uh, they got that right, and it's prospered even more since. But it's my view that the television branch of PBL wasn't left to do its job, that David Leckie was fired, I was put in a situation where I had to go because my authority was being undermined, in my view. By, the, by the, the forces of darkness at Park Street. And Park Street is, for people that might not be Park familiar Street with Park Street is Kerry Packer's headquarters, now James Packer's headquarters, where the true powers of PBL reside. I think you've called that John Alexander in the past. Yes, I've called him various things in the past, most of which aren't suitable for the ABC. No. I might get away with it on one of the uh, nastier uh, FM stations. I think some people who have translated from newspapers to television very well, but not everyone. And I don't think he had a feel for, for commercial television in particular. I think he would have been more comfortable at the ABC or at SBS. As I said once, I think his idea of exciting primetime programming would be a series on Etruscan architecture. So not quite what the viewers are looking for in a... 
Now, I think John Alexander would have his uh, have his problems getting his brain around Survivor or or Big Brother or something like that. You wouldn't have thought there's a lot to get your brain around with Survivor or Big Brother. Well, there is a uh, there is an appreciation that it's what a lot of the audience want to see. You have to put popular tastes before your personal tastes on occasion. Was this always a passion for you? Was it something that you watched when you were a teenager? No, I can't recall watching a lot of television at all when I was a teenager. In fact, almost none. I started in newspapers at the age of 17. I started in television when I was oh, about 23, I think, in Channel 8 Mount Gambia. That almost killed me. Why? Because I worked uh, six days a week, seven days a week, most of the time on my own, although there was another guy who helped me called Richard Winky. I always acknowledge him. And we had to turn out six half-hour bulletins a week and one 15-minute bulletin. So I learnt the ropes because I had no television experience at all when I went there. Mm. I was to shoot the film, edit it, write the scripts, compile the uh, reel, and then I didn't have to read it. The news was read by a local accountant. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's probably a fantastic experience for someone who's going to go on. It's to a great way of learning the ropes, but yeah. if I'd stayed there any longer, I would have been uh, I would have been laid out in a slab. Well, when you went to Nine, your first job with them was 30 years ago in 1973. You were a reporter-producer for Report. a current affair. It was a lot of fun. It was, uh, it was a good day for cowboys in television. Some of it was appalling. Can you give me an example of cowboy TV? Well... On one occasion, I remember personally, I did a story where some former Indian Army major was suggesting we bring back the stocks for people who'd committed assault. Mm -hmm. And so there was, I got a stock, a set of stocks from the ABC set department in Elstonwick, and we uh, took the stocks and some rotten fruit and eggs along to the shopping centre, and I got pelted with eggs and fruit and God knows what as part of the story. I can't imagine we'd do nonsense like that today. <laughs> And what was the upshot of the story? You were just covered in muck, basically. Yeah, I was covered in muck, and the, the, the premise for it was that would people take part in the stocks in the 20th century? Would they join in the fun and throw fruit and eggs? And did they? Oh, they did. They loved mm. it. This was a good example of the kind of thing that you and Mike Willis were getting up to at the time. Yeah, and look, if we if we had a shortfall on the program, say we were running eight minutes short because we Willis and I had been out to a fairly long lunch, which happened fairly frequently. Those were the good old days. They were the good old days. Yeah. And we'd say, well, we're eight minutes short tonight. What are we going to do? And, and Willis would say, it's OK, we'll get Hogs in. So Hogs would come in and have a chat in the studio for eight minutes. But it was wonderfully successful, and it was a lot of fun. Well, what were you like on camera? You've spent most of your life behind it since. I was taken off air once because I was considered too offensive. Offensive in what way? Because uh, my questions were pretty blunt and sometimes fairly rude. I was taken off air and, and restored by public vote. There was a campaign launched in Nara called Keep Meekin Speakin. <laughs> and I, I, I got back on air by a vote of 59 to, sorry, 51 to 49, I think it was. Oh, still, that's yeah, a close oh, call. It was, it was a hair's breath. Hey, talk about Big Brother. That's the, the, the first precursor. time that anyone was voted off television. It was me. And what was Meekin Speakin when, for, when he was thrown off? Can you remember the question which really... No, I can't. It was a general... I think it was a sort of a general sustained level of offensiveness rather than one particular act. And did you tone it down? Not really, because uh, actually my theory in those days was that you, it was the first question that I always concentrated on. My favourite was when I had Al Grasby, who's Minister for Immigration at the time, and he'd been responsible for getting some mafia people out and giving them visas to come to Australia. So my first question to him, someone sent it to me the other day, someone recorded the interview all those years ago, was, uh, Mr Grasby, how long have you been a travel agent for the mafia? Which... <laughs> produced the biggest explosion and, and that was wonderful because it got a result. Now, I can't remember how much else happened in the interview but it just got the result. I think if you start an interview with a good question it concentrates the mind and it and it's sort of it's like ringing the bell at the start of a fight and it's interesting. I've never believed in journalism that's worthy but dull. Oh, which is what you've accused the ABC of many times, many times. Many times, and sometimes the ABC is guilty, and sometimes I'm just having a bit of sport. <laughs>